So the other day, I was walking my dog. And a neighbor comes up, and he looks really upset. And he says to me, I'm worried about climate change. See, I've heard the ice sheets are melting so quickly that within a couple of decades, they're going to be gone. And while his dog, Rascal, and my dog, Benny, take turns, run around the yard, sniffing at stuff and lifting their legs, he looks me straight in the face, and he says, is it too late? Are we all going to die? Now, I'm used to fielding questions like this for my job. I mean, literally, every day, NASA's global climate change website and our social media pages get lots and lots of comments and questions, and they go something along the lines of, I'm really confused about the solutions to climate change, or I'm worried about the next climate catastrophe, or how much more time do people have left on this planet? Now, instead of force feeding you what I think, what I'd rather do is light these here balloons on fire, and then we can look at the science together. So this is a balloon filled with air, and you could probably predict what happens when I put the fire to it. It pops. But what happens if I put this fire onto a balloon filled with water? Now, you may be wondering if I'm going to stand here with this stupid lighter and this stupid balloon for the rest of my talk, but I took the liberty of performing the same science demo <laughs> just a few days ago with a much bigger flame. So um, I have to tell you first that I like watching magic. In fact, I love watching magic, but I have exactly zero skill or talent in performing magic. This is absolutely not magic. This is science. And what's happening here is that the heat from the fire is being absorbed by the water in this balloon, just like that heat from that fire is absorbing the water. Um, that heat in that balloon is absorbing the heat from that fire. And that's because you may think that water is this boring, stupid stuff that's around you all the time and you're really familiar with it, but water is very unusual, very weird, and very sp special stuff. It has this property called heat capacity, and water has very extremely high heat capacity. And while this balloon that you see right here, the one that I popped, and the one in that photo are actually from the same bag from a regular party store, the difference here, obviously, is this is a much smaller flame, and that's a much bigger flame. And you can see here, the flame's even bigger, but the water's the same. And the reason why this is important is because we've been burning fossil fuels. And a fossil fuel is coal, oil, and natural gas. And by burning these fossil fuels, we've added carbon dioxide and other heat-trapping gases to Earth's atmosphere, so the surface temperature has increased. But what you may not know is up to 90% of the heat from global warming is being absorbed by Earth's oceans, just like the heat from this fire is being absorbed by the balloon. And so much heat is absorbed by the balloon that it pulls it away from the latex, and that's why the balloon doesn't pop. So what's happened is that warmer water is expanding and added to the water that's flowing into the ocean from the melting ice sheets and the melting glaciers, what we have is sea level rise. Additionally, my generation, your generation, everybody that's alive on planet Earth right now, and many, many future generations are going to have to cope with the consequences of today's climate change even after we've moved away from burning fossil fuels and transitioned to renewable energy because the heat is being stored in our ocean just like the heat is being absorbed and stored in this balloon. And what that means is that we're going to have to face climate change for many, many hundreds of years. Now, I'm not telling you this to scare you, but to empower you so that we can make a difference, you and I, together. Because denying the science of climate change or avoiding facing the consequences of climate change or feeling so freaked out and so helpless, those are not solutions. What do you think might happen if instead of seeing climate change as this burden that we've got to drag along, this heavy weight that we've got to bear, what would happen if instead we thought about climate change as this amazing challenge? Because challenge is exciting and challenge is inspiring. Challenge makes us grow. 
without struggle, without challenge, without discomfort. Nobody would ever improve, and nothing would ever, ever get better. There's something special, something unique that happens when you try to do something that seems impossible. And that's very different from trying to do something that you already know that you can do. Can you imagine if us NASA people just sat around going, oh, that's too hard, every time some ginormous obstacle happens? Of course we don't. Let me just walk you through kind of a handful of steps that it takes going from conception to getting a fleet of Earth orbiting satellites into space. So it starts by designing a scientific instrument, and that can take something on the order of a decade. And then oftentimes, these scientific instruments are tested on modified NASA aircraft. And a, a modified NASA aircraft is basically just an airplane with a bunch of holes in it so that the scientific instruments can stick, stick out. And then what happens, the seats are removed, or many of them, and the instruments are put inside the plane, and then you get all kinds of things like uh, racks of computers and a whole bunch of cables, and then the scientists and the engineers get in that plane and they fly around testing the instruments. Now, while that's going on, you have software engineers starting to write code. And oftentimes, the code has to be written for hardware that doesn't even exist yet. And that sounds about as complicated as you may think it does. Then, the spacecraft is assembled in a clean room, folded up, tucked into a nose cone that's put on top of a rocket that's launched into space and achieves orbit. Piece of cake, right? So right now, what we have is 20 handmade, one-of-a-kind, unique scientific experimental instruments dedicated exclusively to studying Earth's climate and Earth science. And you would think that once all these get into orbit, it would be smooth sailing, right? But the truth is that each one of them is sending down reams upon reams of data every day. And all of that data needs to be validated at ground stations, not just once, but over and over and over again, because the world absolutely must have accurate science data, especially about climate change. And what this means is that somebody somewhere, sometime, is troubleshooting something just about all day, every day. And the thing is, we kind of like it. We think it's cool. And that's because we understand that scientific experimentation involves struggle. And we also under understand that grit and determination will get you everywhere. And I tell you, when somebody who works at NASA uses the term everywhere, we literally mean everywhere. <laughs> so a few years ago, a group of third graders came to visit NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, where I work. And they were being really well behaved, so I decided to rile them up because field trips are supposed to be fun as well as educational. So I was all like, who likes Justin Bieber? And they were all like, ah! And then I said, who wants to be a scientist when you grow up? And it was dead silence. So finally, this little kid in the front row, he comes forward and he says, I'm not smart enough to be a scientist. And so I puffed myself up real big as though I'm going to take on the person who made him feel bad about himself. And I said, who told you that? And he said, I thought it in my own mind. Now remember, these kids are nine years old. So I looked at the class and I said, how many of you thought in your own mind that you're not smart enough? And about three quarters of the class raised their hand. Now, I understand how these kids feel. I have to be honest with you, I have not had doubt about my intellectual ability or my mental capacity, but I have always felt like I did not belong in the field of science. When I was in third grade, somebody came to our class and they said, maybe you could be the first female astronaut. And I remember very specifically thinking, no, I couldn't, not me. And I stayed disconnected from science all the way through high school and on into college. And even today at my job, I often feel like a misfit and like I don't belong. I feel more comfortable with artists and athletes than I do with people who have a PhD. Maybe it's some stereotype that I bought into that I don't even understand or a preconceived notion about how a science person is supposed to behave. 
maybe it's I have an idea in my head that I'm supposed to be sitting nicely at my desk when what I really would want to be doing is this. <laughs> but that day, I told those third graders the same thing that I had learned to tell my inner third grade self. And I hope it's the same thing that you decide to tell your inner third grade self today. And that is, all of us have an all of us have a natural born scientist, curious about the way the world works. All of us have an inner science spark that could be ignited into a glorious flame. And all of us need to stay connected to the conversations that are happening around climate change, even when it's hard, even when we feel like running, even when we feel hopeless, especially when we feel hopeless. It wasn't until I was in my junior year in college when I first became connected to science. I was taking an oceanography class and we started studying sea slugs. Yeah, sea slugs. A sea slug changed my life. So I was an avid scuba diver at the time and I'd never noticed them until we learned about them in class and then all of a sudden I started to see them everywhere. And it wasn't like they had just came there just for me. They'd been there the whole time, and I'd been swimming so quickly, I'd never noticed them. And it made me wonder, what else would I start to notice if only I slowed down long enough to pay attention? They seemed small and vulnerable and delicate, and I identified with that. And what the sea slug taught me was to value something, to make something so important to me to make something that I cared about so much that it was more important than my struggle and my challenge and my discomfort. So as individuals and as a society and as a global society, in order to move away from fossil fuels so that we can lower our carbon footprint and mitigate the climate change that's already happening, and as individuals and as a society and as a global society, if we're gonna adapt to the climate change that's already set in motion, then as individuals and as a society and as a global society, we could find things about our environment, about the natural world, about this planet that are so important to us that we care more about them than we care about our struggles and our challenges and our discomforts. At the entrance to NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory where I work is a sign and it says, Dare Mighty Things. And I walk past those three words multiple times a day because they're also in the office building where I work. And the way I see it, that sign is talking directly to me. I dare you, it says. I dare you. Not to try something easy, not to try something that I already know I can do, but that sign is daring me to run towards something hard. And now I dare you, decide to stay with science. Go home and light your own water balloon on fire. And if you're a kid, find an adult to help you. <laughs> so there's two things I want you to know about this. One is, and this is the most important perhaps, I just told you to do this experiment at home. What I meant is this experiment, not that one. So I'm wearing a lot of fire protective gear here. And what you don't see is just off frame, there's a bunch of people with fire extinguishers. And yes, this, it was exciting. And yes, it was challenging to put on that fire gear and put my arm in that fire. But more importantly, inside those flames is a water balloon that did not pop, even though I held it there until my arm was tired and took about half an hour and I finally just got tired. And what I want you to remember is that climate change is serious. That water in that balloon absorbed the heat from that fire in the same way that right now our ocean is absorbing the heat from global warming. So let's light the world on fire, not by burning fossil fuels, but with our burning desire to understand the world around us. What would happen if we ran toward the challenge of climate change with confidence, strength, and courage? Perhaps our story could be a shared story about not giving up. Perhaps our story could be a shared story about moving forward. So when your neighbor comes up to you and they look upset, 
and they say, I'm worried about climate change and the ice sheets melting. And they ask you, do you think it's too late? I hope you decide to look them straight in the face. And I hope you decide to tell them, no, it is not too late. We got this. Game on, climate change. Game on. Thank you.